Today we're going to be learning all about soil examination for forensic science. So factors such as temperature, rainfall, and the chemicals and minerals in the soil influence the production of soil. So soil doesn't just exist, it is made. And because of that, soil from different locations can have different physical and chemical characteristics because they have a different temperature, different rainfall, and different chemicals and minerals in their surroundings. So that means that soil analysis can be helpful in solving crimes, including linking suspects to a crime scene or locating burial sites because soil is commonly found at crime scenes and burial sites, and oftentimes the soil does end up on suspects or victims. So a little bit of history for you. Dr. Hans Gross is believed to be one of the first to recognize the importance of physical evidence. And his book, which we've mentioned before, Criminal Investigation, written in 1893, had groundbreaking material in this science. So he really talked about how physical evidence, like soil, could be used to solve crimes. However, it was Georg Popp that is credited with being the first to use soil evidence in order to actually solve a crime. He linked soil samples found on a suspect with samples found at a crime scene, therefore concluding that the suspect must have been at that crime scene. Now, you'll need a lot more than that nowadays to get a conviction, but at the time, it was pretty groundbreaking. So what is soil? Soil is part of the top layer of the Earth's crust, and it contains minerals, decaying organisms, and water in varying amounts depending on where in the world that you are. And these variations can occur even from nearby locations, not just around the world. Soil texture describes the size of the mineral particles that make up the um, soil. So when we talk about soil texture, we're really talking about the size of the grains. Now there are three main grain sizes. We have sand, which is the largest, where you can see the individual particles. If you think about holding sand in your hand, you would see the sand particles. Silt, which is one smaller, where with the naked eye, you really aren't going to see particles um, as clearly, but you can still kind of make them out versus clay, where um, if you've ever had experience with either clay soil or even clay in an art class, you know that you can't actually see the individual particles anymore. They all kind of mush together. They are still technically separate particles, and you can see that under a microscope, but um, we can no longer see them with our eyes. Additionally, there are three subcategories of soil. We classify soil as either loam, peat, or chalk. Now, soil is not just soil. Soil is separated into different layers on the Earth's crust, and we call those different layers horizons. The O horizon is the very top soil horizon. It contains humus, not to be confused with hummus, the delicious Greek treat that has two M's in it. Humus only has one M. And it is made of decaying organic matter. Because of this, in many locations, we do not have the O soil horizon because we don't like to have decaying organic matter around. Next, we have the A horizon, which is called the top soil horizon. And this is a mixture of humus and minerals. Top soil is where many people's um, soil horizons start. However, topsoil is very delicate, and often through construction and other things, we lose the topsoil horizon as well. But it is one of the most nutritious layers as far as plant growth is concerned. So many people add topsoil back in order to grow plants. And that's due to that humus and minerals. In many locations, the first soil horizon you come to is actually the E horizon, the sand and silt horizon. And in this area, oftentimes that is what you see first. We have a very sandy soil that you can see very easily. Then we have the B horizon, which is the subsoil horizon, and it is made up of clay and minerals. So this is if you've ever tried digging in your yard. Chances are you've noticed it gets tougher to dig the farther you go down. That's because as you move to that subsoil horizon, clay is much thicker and difficult, more difficult to dig through. Then we have the broken rock horizon, which is level C. In order to reach this horizon, you would need more industrial equipment typically. And this has very little humus present and is not going to be good for growing anything at all. And then the bottom of the soil horizons is R, which is the solid rock. That's how I remember it. Horizon. 
And this is the very last layer of the soil horizons. So the chemistry of the soil is something else that's very important for forensic science purposes. And one of the properties that's very important to us is whether the soil is acidic or basic. Materials that make up a soil are not the only factors that affect the pH level, although they are gonna be the primary ones. So as you learned in your chemistry class, different substances have different pHs. So what makes up the soil is going to create the pH. However, that pH can be altered due to other factors such as rainfall, can change the value of the pH of the soil, depending on what the pH value of the rainfall you're getting is. Um, pollution is another big one. Pollution can create things like acid rain, which can acidify soil, um, or the pollution itself can just be acidic or basic and get put into the soil. Additionally, fertilizers um, can make soil more acidic or basic, depending on what trying to growing conditions the person is trying to replicate. So we can change the pH value of the soil, either accidentally or on purpose, but all soil does have a base pH level. The pH value of a soil sample can help a forensic scientist match it to other samples. This allows us to put a numerical value on our soil, so we're no longer just saying they look similar. We are able to say that they have a chemical characteristic in common. Now, sand is one of our most common um, soil types. This often surprises students, but if you look outside your house, you'll find that our soil around here is very sandy. Now, sand is made by the action of wind and water on rocks. That is how we get sand. Now, this can take millions of years, and if you ever go to the ocean, you can actually see sand being made kind of in action with shells where you will find sections of beach that have very beautiful soft sand, but you occasionally hit that patch that has very jagged sand where it hasn't been broken down yet. And millions of years from now, it will be nice sand. So because water acts as a buffer, water produces sand more slowly than wind. So the sand we see at the ocean is actually being produced much slower than like desert sand because wind blown sand, and you get, you typically have a decent amount of wind in deserts, becomes rounded more quickly because not only are the grains striking against each other, the wind is working on it. So it has two things happening where the wind is going over it and then the grains are grinding against each other. As opposed to water made sand, which is only being influenced by the water, the grains don't often touch each other in the water. So sand from different locations contains different combinations of minerals. All sand is not created the same. However, the most common mineral found in sand is quartz, which is why most sand does have a slightly shiny appearance. And other minerals may be present in smaller quantities. Grains of sand can be rounded or angular, depending on the amount of weathering and the mineral composition of the grains. Some minerals don't round down at all, and no matter how much you mess with this grain of sand, they continue to form angles. Meanwhile, other substances do round down very nicely, creating rounded sand. So sand also has unique shapes to it. When I said that there could be other minerals, some common ones are feldspars, which often give it a slightly yellow color, micas, which make it very sparkly. We have a lot of mica in our sand around here, which is why if you've ever thought it looks like there's glitter in the soil, that's because there's mica in there. And iron compounds. We also have a lot of iron compounds in our sand around here. You can tell that because our soil is a red color, and that's because the iron in our soil has rusted in our soil. Meanwhile, in other places of the country that don't have iron, their soil is not red like ours is. Sand can also be made of organic materials, such as coral or seashells. So there are actually different types of sand. So let's talk about them. Up first, we have continental sand. This is made of granite, quartz, feldspar, mica, and dark minerals. Its identifying feature is quartz. So this is what we have here in Georgia. Now, just because we have continental sand, continental sand still can be present with different quantities of different things in different areas. The sand across the entire state of Georgia is not the same as each other. It does differ with different areas. Then there's volcanic sand, which to have you need to either be near a volcano or your location previously had an active volcano. And volcanic sand is known for being black. If you've ever heard of black sand beaches, it is either caused by a volcano 
or they've shipped in dyed black sand, one of the two. And it is known for its dark color, and this is due to black basalt, green olivine, and the volcanic ash that makes it up. Its identifying feature is that it's very dark color, and also that it contains no quartz. You will not find quartz in volcanic sand. Next, we have skeletal, sometimes called biogenic sand. This is what you're familiar with from the beach. It is made of broken shells, coral, coralline algae, and sea urchin remains. And its identifying feature is it indicates that you are near some sort of warm water life, like at the ocean, where there's plenty of warm water life right there. Then last but not least, we have precipitate sand. This is made of calcium carbonate. And it is oolithic, meaning rounded, egg-shaped or round, spheres of calcium carbonate from rocks. Now, a cool fun fact is skeletal sand gives off bubbles when mixed with an acid. The presence of soil unique to a certain area can show that a suspect or victim must have been in that area. So... A soil scientist knows all about the different soil types in an area and can figure out where a person or may have been based on the soil that is in their shoes, for example. Layers of soil or sand taken from shoes or wheels can show a suspect present at a series of locations. If you go multiple locations, multiple layers of soil can get put in your shoe treads or in your wheel treads resulting in seeing multiple locations that someone has been through. Now, we do often just look at samples macroscopically, meaning using our eyes, maybe a magnifying glass to say that they look similar. But another feature that we often use is x-ray diffraction, where we are looking at how the different ways it diffracts light um, to get a more detailed look at the sample and its characteristics. So that is all for today's notes. Come to class, we're ready to practice more with soil.